When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Kroger, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. Welcome to True Spies, the podcast that takes you deep inside the greatest secret missions of all time. Suddenly out of the dark, it's appeared Bin Laden. You'll meet the people who live life undercover. What do they know? What are their skills? And what would you do in their position? Vengeance felt good. Seeing these people pay for what they'd done felt righteous. True Spies from Spyscape Studios, wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 484, Hitler Cleans House. Last time, on December 18th, 1941, just 179 days after Operation Barbarossa had started, Army Group Center, in the throes of disintegration, had been ordered to halt its retreat and turn and face the enemy. It would stand fast and wait for reinforcements. And when spring came, the march back to Moscow would commence. But the greatest threat to the men of Army Group Center at the moment was not the Russians. It was the cold. While de Fuhrer considered himself as someone who was good at thinking off the cuff, not only surviving a crisis, but thriving despite one, Von Braudich, the now former Army CNC, was not the only victim of Barbarossa's failures. Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt, commander of Army Group South, had wanted to stop his advance in late September, just after the capture of Kiev. After all, his men had been on the move for three months straight. To be sure, they were content, but still tired. His panzers were worn down and needed parts, if not outright new panzers, and his supply line was lengthening by the day. But he was told to keep going. Then von Rundstedt had wanted to stop again, this time for the winter, when his troops had reached and taken the Dnieper River. But Berlin said no. Time, their excuse was, would allow the enemy, currently shattered, to regroup and consolidate to the areas due east of Kiev and to the southeast that led to the Crimea and the oil fields east of the Black Sea. So the men and panzers went on as ordered, but soon the autumn rains and Stalin's scorched earth policy was making things difficult for them. But Army Group South did not disappoint. By taking Kharkov, about 200 miles or 321 kilometers east by southeast of Kiev, in late October, and at Mariupol, a port city on the northeast corner of the Sea of Azov, another two Soviet armies were trapped. The defenders had just lost another 100,000 men. And last of all, von Manstein, commander of the 11th Army, was able to conquer the Crimea minus Sevastopol. But still, Hitler wanted more. He willed Army Group South to continue. But by midwinter, the cold proper had come, and soon there wasn't enough of anything to continue. Besides, as the invaders were far away from their base of supplies, Soviet partisans were much more aggressive here, and their focus, wisely, was on the invaders' supply lines versus the soldiers and the weapons themselves. As for von Rundstedt, commander of Army Group South, he was also worse for wear. He was 65 years old, smoked constantly, and in October had a mild heart attack, which is when he started drinking. And just the idea of continuing his attacks, which Hitler demanded, exhausted him. But he kept on. On November 21st, von Kleist and his 1st Panzer Group, along with Waffen-SS General Sepp Dietrich's 1st SS Division, captured Rostov, 80 miles or 128 kilometers east of Mariupol. From there, they could turn south and enter the Caucasus region. But the Russians, having gained time, launched a potent counterattack a few days later. And on November 28th, Rundstedt authorized von Kleist to withdraw his forces from Rostov, 
versus having his entire force surrounded. This got back to Hitler, who ordered that Rostov be held. But von Rundstedt had had enough. He replied to Berlin, Should confidence in my leadership no longer exist, I beg to request someone to be substituted who enjoys the necessary confidence of the Supreme Command, i.e. Hitler, who accepted this challenge. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Kroger, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. On December 1st, Rundstedt was dismissed, and General Reichenau was now the new commander of Army Group South. Of course, Reichenau took one look at the overall situation and said, oh yeah, we have to stop. But he wisely got Halder, chief of staff of the Army High Command, to put that request to Hitler. He was his buffer. On a side note, Hitler would realize he may have just made a mistake. So he flew to the area on December 3rd, and after speaking to Reichenau and Sepp Dietrich, the SS commander, he told Rundstedt, Oh, I misunderstood. Tell you what, you go take a break, and then, and I love this part, once more place your incomparable services at my disposal. But von Rundstedt would never see the Russian front again. His future would be in the Western Theater. Yet, as Hitler was the head of state, politics was never far from his decisions. Thus, the failure to take Moscow and the retreat of Army Group Center was placed at the feet of von Braudich, who was no longer in his position to defend himself, and heads would keep rolling. After Hitler's not one single step back order, Army Group South's von Bock stressed to Berlin that unless his men could fall back further— There would be a disaster, the kind that armies nor countries recover from, and with that message, he conveniently placed his head on the block. Fortunately, his deteriorating health offered up an out to everyone. Von Bock's strenuous leadership, the official story went, that had delivered Armor Group Center to the very outskirts of Moscow, had taken its toll. It was time for fresh leadership. Thus, on December 19th, General Gunther von Kluge, commander of the 4th Army, was now the C&C Army Group Center. Ironically, von Kluge would replace von Bock again, next time, in the West. Not that he fared any better against the Western troops. And the prima donna, General Fast Heinz Guderian, was soon to be relieved as well, which is a story unto itself. It is a maxim that the higher the rank one goes, the more politics has to be incorporated into one's thinking. And as good or aggressive as Guderian was with his armor, he should have been equally so with his game face, his professional manners, and his ability to suffer those he deemed fools. Just days before von Braulich was relieved of his post, he had flown out to meet with von Bock at Smolensk. Then he flew further east to talk to Guderian and von Kluge. Not knowing that he was about to be sacked, Braulich got an earful from these two generals with the intent of relaying all that they had said accurately back to Hitler, reminding his leader that he was only the messenger. Specifically, Guderian told Braulich that he needed more tanks if he was to continue anything, moving forward or being able to successfully fall back. Currently, he was down to about 40 tanks. The good news was that, just the day before, Hitler had ordered 78 Mark III's and 25 Stug III assault guns to be diverted from reinforcing Army Group South to go to Guderian. This was nice. This was a good start. But still, Guderian was asking for permission to retreat to Orel, about 90 miles or 144 kilometers southwest of Tula. The reason for this is that there was the Oka River, 
that runs from Kaluga, a city about 100 miles or 161 kilometers due north of Orel, south to Orel, and along that river, were still German fortifications. Guderian's reasoning was, clearly, it was going to take some time for Berlin to send him enough reinforcements to truly take back the initiative, and that defensive line along the Oka River would give him that time. It made sense to Guderian, but it smacked of defeatism to those in Berlin, certainly to Hitler. Next to enter the picture was one Colonel Rudolf Schmundt to talk to Guderian. Schmundt might have only been a corporal, but he was Hitler's chief military adjutant and a member of Hitler's inner circle. He could do things off the books that generals officially could not do on the books, and Guderian knew this. Side note, it would be Schmundt who suggested it to Der Fuhrer that he personally take command of Army Group Center as there were no other suitable officers. Now that's influence. Rank be damned. Colonel Schmundt flew back to Hitler's headquarters and told him of Guderian's needs, the urgency, and the strain upon the panzer commander. To wit, Hitler put in a call to Guderian. The Nazi warlord told Guderian things would be worked out, and he gave specifics. First, transport squadrons would be increased, and one would specifically be for Guderian. Second, a formation of BF-110 fighter bombers would soon be on their way to Guderian's position. And third, replacements and fresh divisions would soon be on their way from France. Guderian thanked his superior, saying that he felt better now, now that Hitler knew of the true situation of the East. Which is when Hitler showed that he did not know the true situation of the East, when he replied, This is all that I am doing for you. What you must do for me is not retreat any further. Welcome to True Spies. The podcast that takes you deep inside the greatest secret missions of all time. Suddenly out of the dark, it's appeared Bin Laden. You'll meet the people who live life undercover. What do they know? What are their skills? And what would you do in their position? Vengeance felt good. Seeing these people pay for what they'd done felt righteous. True Spies from Spyscape Studios. Wherever you get your podcasts. To be clear, most of Army Group Center did not fear the Soviet counterattacks for their ferocity or numbers. No, they feared their inability to react as they had in the past. Given that back then, and we are only talking in terms of weeks, they had more men and more fuel, and cold was not the problem that it was now, resulting in a loss of trucks and tanks. In other words, most German officers were content to let the Soviets come at them, for they had proven time and time again to be able to inflict losses on the Russians much more than they could inflict on the Germans. But that was before the cold robbed them of their vehicles and weapons. Thus was the fresh men and material needed, plus winter clothing, for the vast majority were still wearing their summer uniforms. As for Guderian, he tried another end run around von Bock by asking for permission to fly to Hitler directly to confer. But von Kluge, a higher rank, nixed this. Then rumors started flying around that Kluge would soon replace von Bock as the new CNC of Army Group Center, which was another reason for Guderian to need to talk to Hitler directly. Von Kluge and Guderian had clashed numerous times in the past, and they hated each other. The last thing Guderian needed was someone who hated him standing over his shoulder. As he told von Bock, he must be free to operate as he saw fit. It's not that Guderian wanted to retreat all the way back to Orel, not really. He just wanted to get Hitler's attention and to be resupplied so he could attack more efficiently. But as the not-one-step-back order came, Guderian and Hopner the 4th Panzer Group commander, did everything they could to avoid it. For why have panzers if you are not allowed to be mobile in dealing with unfolding situations? They needed freedom of movement, but that had been taken away from them. 
On the Russian side, the more General Zhukov pushed his counterattack, the more flexible Guderian desired to be. By December 12th, the Kalinin Front, to the northwest of Moscow, the Western Front, in front of Moscow, and a part of the Southwestern Front, had pushed the invaders back to the point that some 400 villages were now free of excess troops. And as aggressive as these Red Army formations were being, they were being matched by the communist newspapers. Pravda and others reported on the pushback of the enemy near Moscow, of the cruel atrocities seen by the Soviet soldiers as they chased the enemy away. Then, Stalin ordered that men like Zhukov and others be put on the front page to give the Russian people their heroes. This was only the second time Zhukov's photo had been published. As for the meat of their stories, they remained less accurate, as Soviet casualties were just as numerous as they had been since June, the difference being they were now losing men while attacking the enemy, driving them back, versus being surrounded and starved to death. Preferable, but still deplorable. By December 16th, Zhukov's first phase of defending Moscow was over, and it had been a bloody success. Now Zhukov wanted to push further west and northwest of Moscow by some 130 kilometers, or 80 miles. Now, this was not overly ambitious, but it was realistic. And given the lack of training, weapons, and proper clothing for some of the Soviet troops, this was doable. Also, Zhukov knew that he would have to settle for frontal attacks, as his men were not sophisticated enough to do anything else. Thus, he would lose many, but the enemy would be driven back. To this plan, Stalin said yes and no. Yes to the second phase of the offensive, but no to the four additional armies Zhukov was asking for. No, those troops would go to the wings of Zhukov's attack. Stalin still wanted to encircle the entirety of Army Group Center, no matter how unrealistic that was. The Man of Steel, who had all but collapsed after Kiev was lost, as did the Stavka, was now on the mend and once again wanted to control everything. Zhukov knew better than to argue. Still, Guderian's day of reckoning was coming, as were others. Hitler needed absolute resolve from his commanders. No talk of logistics or shortages. Per Hitler, these would all be overcome with national socialist vigor. But that theory was about to be put to the test. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So, um... Just saying hi to some new members. Let's see here. Um, Martin is sending in his yearly check. Thank you very much, Martin. And let's see here. Devonta Shavers from Maricopa, Arizona has become a member. So thank you very much to both of those. Did not get any donations, which means daddy didn't get any beer. Uh, so let's work on that, shall we? No, I'm just joking. But anyway, uh, so again, thank you for listening. And um, I've got a couple of interviews coming up. And I'm going to do another standalone episode that uh, hopefully you'll like because uh, I got a, a good response from the top five World War II movies. So I'm going to do another standalone. We'll see how it goes. That's coming out soon. But until next time, as always, take care, everyone. Welcome to True Spies, the podcast that takes you deep inside the greatest secret missions of all time. Suddenly out of the dark, it's appeared in Laden. You'll meet the people who live life undercover. What do they know? What are their skills? And what would you do in their position? Vengeance felt good. Seeing these people pay for what they'd done felt righteous. True Spies from Spyscape Studios. Wherever you get your podcasts. 
My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a historian, professor, and the creator of History That Doesn't Suck, a podcast that provides a complete overview of U.S. history through storytelling, yet keeps the rigor you'd expect in a university class. Starting with 22-year-old George Washington in his first battle, join me for a chronological telling of the United States' story. It's unlikely revolution, fractious civil war, tenacious inventors, brave reformers, and more. With more than 100 episodes, you can already binge listen your way through the progressive era. Find History That Doesn't Suck wherever you get your podcasts.